Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Lowell Ewert on human rights and peace. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And each week I'm very glad to welcome a guest here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario to talk about some important aspect or topic of global governance. And this week I'm very happy to welcome Lowell Ewert, who is the Director of the Peace and Conflict Studies Program. It's good to be here, David. At Conrad Grable University College here in Waterloo. And uh, Lowell, you're an expert in peace, conflict, conflict resolution, international law, human rights, a whole range of things. And we uh, would like to focus today on the connection between human rights okay. and peace. So if it's all right, we will start off generally speaking about mm -hmm. the conceptual relationship between human yeah. rights and peace. How do you understand that uh, relationship and uh, how, how is your understanding different perhaps from that of the person on the street? I think the relationship between law and peace is one that we don't often think about. It's a little bit like the air in a room until the air is gone or polluted. We don't realize that we're missing it. The way I would describe the relationship between law and peace and human rights and peace would be like the, the structure of a building where you have the walls, the floor, the roof, the ceiling, the windows, the doors. What the, the walls do is it protects you from the hail of persecution. The roof protects you from the wind of, of uh, of, of uh, discrimination and <clears throat> the building itself, the rigid structure of law provides some safety for the occupant so that you're safe, you have your human security, you don't have to worry about uh, whether somebody will come in and break into your, uh, your home and harm you or that you're protected from the elements. What law can't do, in my view, or does very, very poorly is make the occupants in the house actually like each other and get along, relate to each other as friends and colleagues. What law can do is it can set the minimum standards, the, the minimum floor, if you will, that says that this, these are the rules by which we will relate to each other and treat each other. But in terms of the, the human attributes of love, reconciliation, respect, and those kinds of things, law struggles with doing that. And that's where I think the relationship between law and peace is that these two concepts desperately need each other in order to create the kind of humane and just world that we want. For example, if in Canada in winter, you and I like each other a lot, we're great friends and we have a great relationship, but we're outside in the middle of a snowstorm. We're gonna be cold, we're gonna get sick, uh, we're gonna wanna go somewhere else very, very quickly and our relationship will, will suffer as a result. Um, what we need is to bring these two elements together, the law, the structure, uh, and piece the human attributes together to make life have that kind of human meaning and human dignity that really gives life the, 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 the deep sense of meaning that uh, we as humans crave. So now, that's when when you and I talk about mm -hmm. human rights and law, probably we're inclined to say that neither is a necessary and sufficient condition for the other. Or that's there might right. be necessary conditions for each other, but they're not sufficient. So you, you could say that a lot, of, a lot of human rights in the world at, a, at an abstract conceptual level, but in various places, laws don't go, do a good job that's right. of acknowledging them that's or right. protecting them. And vice versa, you might have mm -hmm. all kinds of laws that in fact violate people's. That's right human rights. So when you talk about this connection, you're, you're talking specifically about a legal apparatus that would respect and protect right. a set of human rights. That's right. It's rigid. It changes slowly. It is enforceable in e unequally, in, uh, not always at the same rate and so forth, but it's the rigid structure that determines how society mm -hmm. is born or yeah, wired. Right. Now, as you know, some people interpret human rights in a very global cosmopolitan way. There's sort of one set of human rights that all human beings enjoy mm -hmm. uh, in virtue of being human beings. And others tend to contextualize them culturally and say that human rights are something that really can only make sense or be understood in the context of local norms and customs right. and histories and traditions. Where do you fall on that spectrum? And is there room for a negotiation between those two views or are they just two separate hmm. yeah. ways of understanding the same concept? I think there's a lot of room for contextualization and understanding. I think if you take all of the human rights instruments together, you put them in a blender, you grind them up, distill them down, and then you boil out the core essence. What you're left out with is about four principles. One would be the principle that everyone has a right to participate in the organized political life in which they are at. Second would be everybody has the right to hold power accountable. The third one would be everyone has the right to work for change without having to use violence. So you have the right to petition, protest, and do those kinds of things. And the fourth principle would be that um, everyone is entitled to certain basic human dignity. 
if you use this framework for understanding what human rights is all about, so not the specific legal provisions, but more of the, the core essence or the, the smell as you, you distill and boil this, uh, this mixture down, I think you can apply those particular principles to almost anything you do. So for example, if you're dealing with um, another culture that has a different way of understanding um, how political life is organized, but you do find that everyone in the community or the, or the, the areas is allowed to participate in political decisions, even if that way might be a little different than in a normal democratic process that we would say is the most appropriate. Mm -hmm. I would argue that the right of participation is probably still being met. Mm -hmm. Or if they're able to hold power accountable, or if they're able to work for change, if they disagree with how communal life is organized, they're able to promote change and argue with those who are in authority over that. I think that one can interpret the impact of human rights in that way if these principles are there, which is different than a strict legal constructionist view of human rights. Mm -hmm. There's a rule, it's enforceable by government, by the courts in a particular way. And I think there's a lot of room to allow cultural nuances if these fundamental four principles of participation, accountability, change, and respecting dignity are affirmed. But you still need those laws and those mm -hmm. sort of strict legal ways of interpreting things to That's make right. sense of and operationalize the human rights in a local context. That's right. right. Very good. We'll be back in a minute with Will Ewart to talk about human rights and peace. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So let's talk a bit about peace. That's one of those <coughs> words we use every day and we right. think we know what it means. Uh, it turns out there's actually quite a lot of <laughs> different ways of understanding peace. Right. There's sort of a negative one, right? Mm -hmm. Peace is the absence of war. Right. And there's a very positive one which has all kinds of content built into it. Mm -hmm. You don't enjoy peace unless you enjoy A, B, C, D, E. Right. <coughs> uh, what's your preferred understanding of peace and is there a particularly good way of thinking about peace when you're just talking specifically about the relationship between peace on the one hand and law and human rights on the other? Well, I, th I have a broad view of the definition of peace. Peace isn't just the absence of war, but it's more the presence of those c conditions that lead to a life that is life-affirming, a uh, context where it's life-affirming. One man, one vote is meaningless in the absence of one man, one bread, or one woman, one bread. So you need these kinds of things to have the kind of life that uh, has value and meaning. I think often when we look at the, the legal definition of rights in terms of you have the right to um, you know, vote and petition and so forth, we miss sight of the fact that uh, without these other uh, elements of, that nurture life and make life sustainable, um, life is tough. And I think a, a broad definition of peace is, is more important here. Mm -hmm. Now at a global level, we used to talk a lot about human rights, uh, right. especially during the Cold War. And to some extent that was instrumental. Right? Mm -hmm. Human rights was a club with which we could beat the Soviet Union and its right. allies. We don't talk as much uh, from a global governance perspective about human rights as we mm -hmm. used to. We talk more about human security. Yeah. Uh, what's your understanding of the relationship between human security and human rights? Or is it just a neologism for what we used to mean by human rights, mm -hmm. or is it something different? Well, I think in the, the Cold War debates that were going on about human rights, the, the West tended to talk about civil and political rights. The Soviet states tended to talk more about economic, social, and cultural right. rights. And so when the two different blocks were talking about what are human rights and, and trying to beat each other down in terms of uh, who was violating human rights, there was often um, a misunderstanding. They weren't even using, they're using the same words, but they weren't meaning the same thing. Uh, when Gorbachev made, I believe, his first trip to the United States, he made a political donation to a homeless shelter in Washington, D.C., because he understood that there were human rights violations represented by the fact that people were homeless, which the Americans did not recognize. I think when we're talking about um, this notion of human security, essentially what's happening is the original intent of the human rights system, which is that there would be one human rights system, not human, not uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, but in social, uh, civil and political rights. But the original intent was that there would be one treaty following up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I think with this notion of human security, where we're talking about the right to um, food security, uh, education security, job security, health security, all of these things, essentially what we see happening is the, the world community is moving slowly back to where they were in 1948 when they were envisioning one universal set of standards, not two which emerged out of the Cold War uh, debates and discussions.
Mm. But this, this language of human security and the different ways of interpreting it locally does still raise this question of whether you're going to privilege certain kinds of rights right. over another. Mm -hmm. So for example, the 1994 uh, UNDP um, report, yeah. Human Development Report, which introduced the concept of human security. Very interesting section where they're interviewing people in different countries about what security means to them. Yeah. And I remember one of the quotations is from this Iranian woman who says, uh, you, you cannot enjoy security until you're married and have a mm -hmm. husband who can provide for you. Right. Well, a lot of people in the West would say that's not human security, that's human insecurity, that's right. dependence upon that's right. another mm -hmm. person. So have we just sort of imported all these old debates about civil and political rights versus economic social rights or, you know, Western liberal understandings of rights and versus, you know, the Asian mm -hmm. or Middle Eastern understandings of rights and brought them back under the human security tent, or have we actually made progress toward a <coughs> universal understanding? I think we're making progress towards a universal understanding because as all of these different elements are coming to the table and being part of the debate, it's challenging all of us to look at this differently. Again, if you look at the, the different um, uh, sectors or the different um, blocks, <coughs> political blocks, some are focusing more on one, some are focusing on another, and I think what we're doing by bringing this together as one concept, one notion, is actually helpful because it's seeing these rights as unified, not as separate and discrete. Mm -hmm. And how does the law figure into the discourse on human security? That's not obvious from the, <coughs> the materials that are available generally on the topic of human security. Mm -hmm. It tends to be very policy oriented. Right. And it doesn't tend to be a legal discourse. Is that a mistake in your view? Is it a gap? Should we be approaching human security problems from a more self-consciously legal perspective? I appreciate what some of the early human rights documents have done and think that it was a good approach. If you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, 30 articles, very short, um, I think 29 of them start with you know, the same kinds of words, but it's very, very short, very, very uh, vague in general. The vagueness and the generality of that has allowed us over time to breathe new life into it. And I think as we look at these legal documents, the more rigid and legal these inspirational human rights documents are, the more they tie our hands and limit the development and evolution of notions of human security and human rights and human dignity, rather than uh, protect it. It's sort of an odd way. Normally in our Western society, we would think of rights and law as being that which uh, advances in, and uh, establishes those, those rights we need. I think when we look at international law, especially human rights law, it is the inspirational vagueness of it that has been its most dynamic impact. If these early treaties had been more specific, like we would expect from our pro uh, province or, or the feds, um, I think we would have seen a far less impact in terms of the evolution of human rights over time. Just as one example, if you look at the early human rights documents, there's not one word in them about corporations. Mm. Today, virtually every major corporation understands that they have some human rights obligations, although they argue about to what extent. Mm -hmm. But yet the law hasn't changed. The rules or the, the human rights laws haven't changed. What's happened is that the interpretation of them has evolved and changed over time. And I think that's the, the interesting dynamic about the, the vagaries or the, the unspecificity of human rights law that has really generated its most uh, exciting and compelling impact. Mm -hmm. And do you think corporations are actually getting with the program or are they talking this language because they realize they need to now in order to sell their products? Yeah. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think corporations have gotten the message that the public demands it. Virtually every consumer, every constituent of a, a multinational corporation understands that they want to be associated and they want to buy products from a company that has a reputation, at least sounds good. So I think uh, corporations are getting with the program. Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest issues is um, because the paradigm is changing so rapidly. And this, this change of corporations and human rights has been dramatic in the last mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years. Virt uh, virtually 15 years ago, there would be have been no books that had, would have linked human rights and business together in the same sentence. So we're talking about a radical shift of political economy mm -hmm. over a relatively short period of time historically. And I think the 
the business and corporate community is catching up with that. It probably still isn't uh, deep into the corporate culture, but I think it's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, these initiatives that are out there in terms of business and human rights are forcing them to improve their performance yeah. and do better. Very good. We'll be back again in a minute with Lowell Ewart. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So uh, development is another mm -hmm. concept that we throw into this mix. Right. There's an interesting and important relationship between peace, human rights, development, law. Uh, what's your understanding of the, the role here? Is, is development something that you measure in terms of respect, stability of human rights, robust edifice of law? Mm -hmm. Or is development something simply measured by gross national product per capita the way yeah. we've always done it? When I'm talking about development, I'm talking more about the international development community in terms of the, the groups that are going out and uh, creating jobs and providing health care and those kinds of things. So the organizations that are delivering practical development interventions uh, in other places around the world. If you look at the relationship between rights and development at that level, there are a couple ways of looking at that. First, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that there has never been a famine where basic civil and political rights have been respected. That's an Amartya Sen quote. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, there aren't refugees where basic civil and political rights are respected because the definition of a refugee is somebody whose rights have been violated. Three, um, this is my, my statement that I, I make, but I, I know I can't prove it, and it's something I would like to work on someday. Earthquakes cause more damage where basic civil and political rights are violated. Uh, for uh, environmental degradation is more difficult to combat where so, uh, civil and political rights are violated. These are all the kinds of interventions that development agency workers address. The relationship between the two is where you have a climate of respect for human rights, where people can petition, protest, vote, um, participate in the marketplace of ideas. These issues are far more solvable. <coughs> So if people are hungry, they can call up people, they have the freedom to call, uh, others have the freedom to organize responses to that and so forth. So when we're looking at the link between civil society development and human rights, the, the argument that I would make is that these two uh, areas are inextricably linked. If you want to combat the AIDS crisis, respect human rights because as uh, Jonathan Mann in the Harvard uh, Masters of Health and Human Rights Project has said, uh, human rights are more important than condoms in fighting the spread of the HIV AIDS virus because if people have the right to, to take, um, uh, gather information and control what happens to their own bodies, mm -hmm. they can protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would say uh, that there's a really tight link between development and, and human rights because these human rights principles empower, it's a little bit like um, adding octane to your gasoline. It fuels the notion of development and makes it more effective, more efficient, and more, more powerful. Mm -hmm. The second way I would look at it is that um, a study that um, was done out of Boston by Mary Anderson and her group a number of years ago talked about the relationship between doing more good work and more um, identif doing work that uh, in the development industry that impacts key people or more people. So for example, one of the issues in uh, cross-cultural uh, communications is how can we get Israeli and Palestinian kids to like each other? So you have encounter groups. Mm -hmm. And you do that with more people, so you have more kids or key people, you get the village leaders and the religious leaders, community leaders to do that. What this study found is that if you only stay at the level of more people or key people, the, these interventions are okay, but they probably won't stick. Mm. The next violent incident, the next bombing, the next attack, whatever, and a lot of the gains that have been achieved are lost. What you need to do to make this effective is to push it down into the structural institutional level to create um, understanding. So you create changes in textbooks, you create changes in um, educational policy and so forth. 
And so when you look at the relationship, in my view, between development, these laudable goals of, of building communities where there has been division and war and conflict, and the structure of, of these, these laws and human rights treaties, you have to push it down into the structural level for it to stick. And once it's at the institutional structural level, one can um, deepen the understanding and it has uh, more staying power. Is there a, a chicken and egg problem here though? Some of these <coughs> problematic societies are, are failed or torn states. Sure. And yeah. really you need a strong state order to mm -hmm. build effective institutions and you know, promote uniform use of textbooks and so on. I'd like to just give one example of a project that I was involved in in, in Egypt. It was working with um, working children who were, um, who because they were poor, they came from poor families, they had to work. Mm. The problem with working children is that if you're working, you're not going to school and then the vicious circle of poverty continues. Right. The organization that I was advising um, decided that rather than approach this as a development only function, approach this more as a institution development, uh, from institutional development angle. So what they did is they talked to kids who were working, they talked to their parents, they talked to employers who were hiring these kids. And they basically asked the kids, what conditions make your life more difficult? What conditions at work allow you to go to school part time and to develop as a human being? Out of that conversation, they developed a standard of about 10 different very simplistic um, statements, a code of conduct. That code of conduct then was shared with employers who had some comments and with the parents who had to affirm it as well. What happened when you took these development interventions, which was the principle was to help kids, but the structuralization or institutionalization was putting this into a code of conduct, essentially institutionalized it that then other microenterprise lenders, other people doing small business development said, hey, that's a good uh, code of conduct. And they were institutionalizing, it became more uh, part of society. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of where it wasn't government that changed, but it was the, the industry itself that was affirming these new standards and slowly over time more, not all, but more agencies were starting to adopt these same things uh, on their own. So it's an example of where Essentially, democracy was built from the ground up, even though the, the formal structure of government wasn't ready to enforce these. Yeah, fascinating example. We'll be back in a minute with Lowell Ewert. If you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast, look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So you've been using the term civil society a lot, and I, I get the impression from what you're saying that the progress, the action, the motor behind a lot of this is, is coming from civil society, not right. so much necessarily from states or international organizations. Uh, you teach a Peace and Conflict That's Studies right. program. In fact, the Conrad Grable, I believe, has one of the older Peace and Conflict Studies programs in uh, Canada. That's right. And you're just about to launch a master's in Peace mm -hmm. and Conflict Studies. So from a, a teacher's perspective, how do you design a curriculum and, and teach students to understand these issues better and actually to make a practical mm -hmm. contribution in the world? Your programs tend to be very praxis-oriented, right, don't right. they? Uh, we view organized political life like a stool with three legs. So there's the government, there's the business sector, and there's this civil society sector. Our view is that for a healthy, just, and sustainable world, all three of these three sectors, these three legs of the stool, need to be working with each other uh, in a balanced relationship. So one needs to have all three legs roughly equally balanced, equally stable, equally strong, and so forth. Um, if you look at nations that have a failed government, where you're balancing on the business and civil society, you have a two-legged stool that's unstable, or a government I would argue a little bit like the United States where it tends to be more business dominated. You have a very strong business economic uh, leg but not the state or civil society. So you have an unstable uh, situation. What we would look at is <clears throat> what is not just the, the strength of the civil society sector but how do these sectors work in relationship to each other. So what we're doing in our program is looking at um, how can we educate, train, and inspire students in the civil society sector to fulfill their role? So in that way, we think we're complementing political science programs, global governance programs that are focusing more on state action, 
we're complementing uh, the MBA programs, the econ programs, and so forth that are focusing on economic development, but we're emphasizing the role of civil society and think that in that mixture um, where we're trying to inspire the three sectors to work together, not in opposition, uh, but to work together to accomplish uh, collaborative goals, that that's where the, the best key to sustainable long-term peace lies. So that's really the vision behind our master's program mm -hmm. and how we would anticipate uh, moving that forward. And how easy is it for these three pillars to communicate with each other? They all have somewhat different vocabularies. And they do. Somewhat <laughs> different worldviews. So cooperation isn't necessarily yeah. obviously easy. Uh, how do you encourage it? How do you move people yeah. into sort of common language spaces and common visions of problems? We, we do that by trying to emphasize the practical impact of the civil society sector. I think oftentimes we look at um, government as having the primary responsibility for creating the conditions that uh, uh, have a more peaceful and just world. But if you analyze the, the role of the civil society sector, where we have organizations that are promoting education, um, healthcare, sports, arts, music, and imagine what life would be like if there were none of these civil society associations that are not driven by government. Um, the burden on the government, burden on business would be dramatically increased if there were none of these civil society organizations because then somebody else would have to step in and, and uh, pick up the cost and pick up the, the task of doing that. So the way we encourage this kind of discussion is simply to emphasize the, the role of civil society that most of us don't really realize. You know, what would your life be like without <coughs> Um, soccer clubs without um, butterfly associations, the symphony organizations, the food banks, the, f the uh, homeless shelters, the, the victim support groups and so forth. Uh, if you've ever been to a hospital, if you've ever been to a music festival, if you ever had a kid in school, uh, you've benefited tremendously from the, the power and the energy of civil society. And I think the problem is that we often don't recognize this incredible um, unquantifiable impact on our life of civil society. I would actually argue that um, back to where we started this, this conversation that human rights principles are trying to set a framework of how we live in society together. What civil society is trying to do is operationalize these basic human rights principles so that it affects us in everything that we do. It's the um, the grassroots practical application of, of human rights principles. And I think once that, that um, a relationship is explained to persons from government and from business, it makes a whole lot of sense, although often we just don't use that language. Now within the civil society sector, it used to be 20, 30 years ago that civil society actors were either focused on human rights or they were focused on peace, right? You had Amnesty yeah. International, Human Rights Watch here, you had yeah. um, the, the freeze movement right. here. Is that changing? Are they coming together? Are the civil society groups that f work on human rights and peace overlapping, cooperating, merging? Yeah. We used to have a situation where I think a lot of civil society organizations were functioning as an adversary. They were against this, against that, and so forth. And I think what we're seeing happen is uh, the organizations are seeing that we need to work together. Government does things that are good and some things that aren't so good. Business does things that are good and not so good sometimes. And so I think what we need to do as civil society is maximize the positive potential and not only see the adversarial nature. The adversarial nature of civil society is important. It is important for somebody to critique the government, business, our structures in society. Um, that is the power of civil society in doing that. But um, we don't need to only invest and in inhabit that space of the critique. We can also look at the partnerships, look for ways to collaborate and um, uh, share new visions for, with government. Very good. Well, that's a very hopeful note to end on, and I appreciate your coming in and sharing these thoughts with us, Lowell. Thank you. It's particularly nice to end on a hopeful note because, in fact, this is uh, the last of the second season of the Inside the Issues uh, podcast series, and we'll be back again, of course, next season uh, with uh, a set of challenging and sometimes not so hopeful topics. <laughs> but thanks for helping us end on a high note to today. Good. And to our audience, thank you again for joining us. And please do join us again in the future uh, for future episodes of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.